Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Rita Zaglul, and I am the coordinator of the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. A coalition of 34 countries led by Costa Rica and France, aiming for the protection of 30% of the land and marine areas by 2030. Mm. I wish to start with some logistical guidance. We might not be able to have an interactive segment to address some questions from you to the panelists. Nonetheless, please do not hesitate on writing them in the chat box um, with your email, and we will make sure to respond them via email in case we do not, we do not have the time to address them. Mm. This webinar will be recorded and shared. This has been a very exciting week, marked by the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and yesterday by the first summit on biodiversity. Today, I have the honor to moderate this panel with outstanding speakers to hear more in depth about their views on the effects of the pandemic and the need of an ambitious global biodiversity framework that addresses the drivers of biodiversity loss and put nature on a path to recovery by 2030, specifically in the context of the African continent. Mm -hmm. I am honored to welcome our panelists. Our first panelist, His Excellency Haley Mariam Desalan, former Prime Minister of Ethiopia. After leaving office, Haley Mariam co-founded and is the chairperson of Haley Mariam and Roman um, Foundation. The foundation focuses on mother and child health care, prevention of non-communicable diseases, nutrition mm. and climate smart agriculture and conservation based ecotourism. Mm. Currently, he is serving as board member and chairperson of various local and international organizations, such as Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, Tourism Ethiopia International Crisis Group and the Global Steering Committee for the Campaign Up for Nature, amongst others. Mm -hmm. Our second panelist is Ralph Feingold. He served as a United States Senator from 1993 to 2011. And from 2013 to 2015, he served as the United States Special Envoy to the Great Lake region of Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. Senator Feingold is the Honorary Ambassador for the Campaign for Nature, which is a global effort calling on policymakers to commit to address the growing biodiversity crisis. And hopefully we will hear more about this uh, today in our discussions. And for the last 10 years, he had taught extensively at various American law universities, including Stanford Law, University, Stanford law School, where he is currently teaching Yale Law School, amongst others. And our third speaker is Professor Rashid Sumaila. Uh, Rashid Sumaila is Professor and Director of the Fisheries Economics Research Unit at UBC's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. He specializes in bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fisheries subsidies, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, and the economics of high and deep seas fisheries. Professor Samaila has experience working in fisheries and natural resources projects in Norway, Canada, and North Atlantic region, Namibia and Southern Africa region, Ghana and the West Africa region, amongst others. Mm. He has published articles in several journals, including Journal of Environmental Ex Economics and Management. And this is just to uh, quote a few of the many achievements of our outstanding panelists. Mm. But moving to our discussion, um, I would like to start with Prime Minister. Your foundation released a major economic report, arguing that across Africa, there is now an opportunity to transition to a more prosperous, stable and sustainable economy that is based on protecting and investing in nature. Are there specific examples of where this transition is already taking place? Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rita. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as you have seen our report, we given a, a title for our report, The Conservation Continent, uh, to bring about Africa's new opportunity for uh, development. Uh, we choose uh, the term Conservation Continent because one of the globally repeatable magazine, The Economist, as you know, has once labeled Africa as a failed continent. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, that was uh, two decades ago. So, um, and after maybe a decade, then um, they said a rising continent. Mm -hmm. 
uh, simply because six out of the 10 fastest growing economies globally were from Africa. Mm. So we have chosen now uh, this time in history of uh, uh, Africa uh, to say the conservation continent. Mm. Uh, that is why we named it as, as such. Uh, number one, we are at the inflection point and there are multiple reasons uh, to protect and invest in nature. Mm. Uh, I think as everyone uh, can see, the global community is hit by multiple shocks. Mm. Uh, Africa is not an exception, mm. but um, Africa is even hit harder compared mm. with uh, other continents. Uh, extreme weather situations, drought, uh, flooding, uh, raising sea level and salt intrusion into agricultural lands. These are locusts, pandemics like Ebola, and recently now, uh, which is a very important <clears throat> moment, we are you know, grappling with COVID-19. So I think uh, if we go continue on uh, this way, uh, when we see unsustainable uh, economic growth, uh, which we, ha we are seeing now, is an important issue we have to address. Mm. Uh, all are related to depletion of nature and ecosystem. Therefore, protecting and investing in nature is critical because nature has the ability to protect us mm. from all uh, this kind of disasters. <laughs> so, I think a new path of uh, development should be uh, sought and uh, we shouldn't repeat, you know, the failures of development paths taken by the West and emerging economies of Asia and Latin America. So we have to find out some ways uh, that Africa has to work. Africa as a latecomer, we have a latecomer advantage uh, we have a comparative advantage over other continents in terms of its nature and biodiversity. If embraced and supported in the right way, prosperity in sustainable way is really possible for Africa. I think sustained, accelerated and shared economic growth is something we can witness. My own country, Ethiopia, has chosen and designed uh, an economic uh, development strategy. We call it a climate smart green development initiative in 2012 and crafted a strategy to implement this uh, you know, program. And we have witnessed a double digit annual economic growth uh, sustained since uh, 2012. So we focused on our energy sources that comes from renewables Ethiopia has uh, almost 90% of all its energy sources coming from renewables. And we focus on uh, conservation agriculture, uh, land management through water and, uh, you know, watershed management for soil and uh, water conservation, community-based conservation, putting community at the center in all our endeavors. So I think uh, these are very important, uh, you know, the strategies we followed. Uh, cleaner production in our growing uh, nascent manufacturing sector, which also uses this clean, clean energy. And our transport system uh, is using this clean energy. You know, we have uh, established a, a railway system, which is electric driven. And similarly, I think uh, uh, we are working on uh, climate smart ecotourism initiatives through, you know, conserving our protected areas. So all these initiatives are within our climate uh, smart green growth uh, strategy. I think this is not only the case in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, uh, in most fast growing economies like in Rwanda, Ghana, Mozambique, Botswana, Tanzania, in Africa, 
Um, I, I think these uh, strategies are being implemented. All of them have their own uh, story that can be told. But uh, my conclusion is I believe that Africa should be dubbed as a conservation continent uh, because uh, uh, where is big opportunity for even more progress. What's required from us is therefore, you know, bold political commitment from government leaders uh, for more support of this policy paradigm to transition to a green development by investing and protecting our nature. So I think uh, uh, Africa, as a latecomer, we have huge opportunity to go for protecting and investing in our nature and choosing a green economic development path. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prime Minister, and thank you for sharing uh, the specific case uh, of Ethiopia. And for all the participants, if you haven't read the report yet, I strongly recommend you to read it since it has many, many uh, important elements and data. I have submitted it in the chat box, so please feel free to download it and, um, and review it. Senator Feingold, uh, we heard during this week many countries calling for a transition in our societies and seeking more inclusive and transformative change. Indeed, we do need political leadership and we need that leadership and political will to be translated into the negotiations of the CBD. And I know, Senator, that you have been tracking the conventions uh, on biological diversity negotiations. So in your view, how would you say that those negotiations are going and are you seeing the required level of ambition and leadership? Thank you, Rita, and uh, I'm honored to be with my fellow panelists here. Um, the uh, Prime Minister was one of the very first when I started working with the Campaign for Nature about a year and a half ago uh, to commit to this initiative and has been an incredible ally helping us to line up other uh, political leadership, both in Africa and otherwise. And, and that's exactly what we need. And I got to tell you, I'm very heartened about this week between the United Nations and seeing this program focusing on Africa, even though I was really worried that the COVID-19 thing would direct us away from focusing on this, I think the reverse is happening because people are seeing that the climate and biodiversity and these diseases and, and, uh, and pandemics are really interrelated. And so uh, I see a, a surge of energy on this. Um, look, we all know that biodiversity doesn't get the same type of political attention as climate change, uh, but the two are very intertwined with each other. Some of my friends in Africa have talked about, have said it's, it's two sides of the same coin. We have to explain it that way to people. It's hard enough to tell people, look, you're in great danger and your children, your grandchildren are in great danger from climate change. And oh, by the way, if we solve that, then you're going to be in great danger from biodiversity. This is a lot, or the lack of biodiversity. This is a lot to take in. And we have to help people uh, absorb the challenges. However, we do have reasons to be encouraged. Science has told us that protecting 30% of the world's land and ocean by 2030 is necessary to help to respond to the danger of mass extinction. But the scientists also say it can be done. And so uh, the Campaign for Nature is supporting the idea that the Convention on Biological Diversity has embraced, and that's the idea that by 2030, we want to preserve 30% of both the oceans and the land on the planet. And that's in the convention's draft plan uh, leading up to the uh, big meeting in Kunming next May in China. And we think this is the cornerstone uh, for an ambitious global effort to protect nature. And I want to stress because, it, you know, as, as the prime minister was saying, you know, the situation differs from country to country, especially in Africa. This isn't that each country has to do 30 percent because that's not possible in a place like Rwanda and Burundi. It's, it's too densely populated. It is an overall global goal of 30% that every country can help. And it's very important to stress that with a number of African countries so they're not being asked to do the impossible. And this progress is largely thanks to countries stepping up. And yes, Costa Rica and France have been the two that have led our high ambition coalition of 30 countries from around the world. And they are championing the 30 by 30 proposal. And a number of those leading countries are from Africa. We got a tremendous response 
and uh, from the various African countries. And I took five or six trips to Africa in the last two years. And everywhere we went, the response was enthusiastic, reflecting exactly what the prime minister said, that this is a moment when Africa not only can, but I think will take the lead in the world in resolving this problem. And in connection with this, the prime minister is part of a group that I assembled of former uh, prime ministers or foreign ministers from around the world called the Global Steering Committee, including uh, President Obasanjo of Nigeria, President Koroma, Sierra Leone, uh, President Sirleaf Johnson, Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, and uh, the former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, uh, the first woman president of Ireland. So we work as a group to try to get this, uh, not just being about, about scientists and environmentalists, but the broader public understanding it. And yes, I just want to reiterate that because of Africa's special status here, the biodiversity of Africa, the fact that it's very involved in both the, the water part, the ocean part of it, and the terrestrial part of it, that it really is uh, going to be the key if we're going to be able to achieve this goal. So um, there's a lot to do. I'm very encouraged uh, at this moment. But we've got a heck of a lot to do between now and next May, and I am uh, delighted that we are talking about it today. Thank you, Rita. Thank you so much, Senator Pangold, and thank you for, for your great work with the steering committee. As you say, we should build on the moment that biodiversity has had during UNGA. Um, never before has such a nar large number of heads of states and heads of government come together and put the biodiversity in the center of their discussions. And I think that this is a key moment for us to build on, on this momentum. Um, Professor Sumaila, uh, you contributed to the major economic report, moving into more the financing uh, piece of, um, mm -hmm. of this issue. Yes. Your report is uh, one of the most comprehensive of its kind, evaluating the economic impacts of the proposal to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. Mm. What did that report find, and is it realistic to think that the world could fund the implementation of this proposal? Yeah, so thank you very much, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, Coordinator, for, for helping us do this. Uh, I feel I'm, I'm privileged to be on a panel with the Senator and the Prime Minister. And so you have the Senator, the Prime Minister, and the Professor, you know, so <laughs> this is quite a special panel, and I'm grateful for that. Now, our report, as you said, I, I see it to be so significant, actually. I consider it to be the the IPCC report for the ocean. That is how I see this. And why do I say this? It's extremely comprehensive. It, it covers land and ocean and anything between them. Uh, so it's all sectors. Uh, it, is, um, <clears throat> it, it was written by over 100 scientists and economists around the world. Just think about that. All of us bringing our, our minds together. You should have seen how the report was going around, all these scientists, everybody bringing his and her, or her, and her ideas together. So this is, this is uh, uh, the, the best we've done. I've always worked on the ocean. So this is the time I really team up with colleagues on land, and this is huge. Now, what did we find? We, we found some encouraging results. I mean, the first thing is that, and this I think I need to stress it really, really, because I see some of us, some part of the population, it is as if green dollars are no dollars. You know, it just amazes me. If you spend money to take care of the environment, is the same. It's almost the same as spending money to take care of your home, the place you live, and the environment is the bigger home for everybody. It's our habitat. Without it, nothing works for us. So what we find is that. Um, Investing in nature is a huge thing for the global economy because that is where everything begins. And, and if I could even talk about a model, if you think about our relationship with nature, we do two, two principal primary things. We go to nature for all the good things we need, the, the fish, the forest, the gold and the diamond. We take it into our economy. We do all the stuff we do with it and we create waste. And where does it go? It goes back to the environment. So from the environment, good things come. To the environment, bad things go. And if we don't do this well, we are toast. I mean, this is... So, so Prime Minister, I love your idea of conservation continent. And which continent should be? Africa is the one to be because that's, in a way, the beginning of all of us. So that's beautiful. It's, it's important. And then we also see in terms of hard cash, we don't need a lot, actually, to achieve this goal. 
We are talking about $250 billion a year of a global economy of several trillions. The ocean alone contributes, according to the OECD, will grow to about $3 trillion in a, in a decade or so. So, so this is chicken change if you compare to the value. And this value is just the direct value. How about the ecosystem services? We, we, we projected about $350 billion of, of what comes in from ecosystem services alone. So there is a lot of value coming. The investment is small. It's only about 0.16% of what we estimated. That is needed to create this 30, uh, 30 by 30, 30 uh, protection on land and on, on ocean by the year 2030. So... So we can do it. It's doable. It's good investment also. We, we discovered that it, for every dollar we put in, we'll get back at least five dollars. So one to five. That is good investment in how you look at it. So, and, and, and then what else? And another thing I should say in connection to this is that we already spend quite a bit of dollars globally by nations, African countries by subsidizing economic activities that actually go to harm nature, you know, give fishing subsidies, fuel subsidies that encourages more fishing, takes down the fish stock. We cut down the trees. We, 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 we pay oil companies to drill. So there's a lot of money already in the system. All we need to do is look closely at what we spend and see how to redirect them in ways that they help nature and help people rather than undermine both of them. And so, of course, we can do this. The, the, as I said, it's not expensive. It's good investment. And there's a lot of resources already that we can redirect. And, of course, there's room to, to grow this. So, yes, we can do this. Africa can do it. It's, the, it's a growing continent, lots of young people. Africa has to do well for the whole world to do well. That's what I tell my colleagues all over. There's no option. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Samaila. And it is amazing uh, that the report found that for one dollar the return would be of five dollars. It, it is pretty amazing. I would again to the participants, and I, I just um, uh, attached the link. I would invite you to also read the, this report. It is uh, indeed uh, very timely and relevant, especially now that countries are working on their economic recovery plans, and uh, it is essential to put the nature in the center of those plans and have uh, a whole of society approach, as it was mentioned before uh, by the Prime Minister. Hmm. Uh, Prime Minister, going back to you, these are important economic findings uh, and focusing on the African continent. Do you think that these findings are resonating with hmm. African governments? And uh, how would you like to see countries act on, on these recommendations, Prime Minister? Uh, sure, Rita, I think it is resonating. Uh, uh, as the Conservation Continent Report uh, found it, uh, as well as uh, there is a emerging uh, recognition of uh, the economic benefits of investing in nature. Uh, you see, um, best examples in Southern Africa, uh, like Namibia, the whole coast has become a, a protected area. Uh, Namibia now exceeds uh, the 30% already. Hmm. Uh, and I think if you if you look into Botswana, uh, uh, similarly Tanzania, hmm. uh, Mozambique, uh, almost uh, most of the Southern Africa countries uh, they have gone beyond the thirty percent protected area, even before twenty thirty. Hmm. Uh, there are uh, uh, countries which are very close to uh, this number. Uh, hmm shows that Africa has huge potential to do that. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia is moving very fast in this area as well. Mm -hmm. Now we are around 20%, uh, but uh, the, the current administration and the prime minister are very much committed on uh, the green legacy and mm -hmm. going for protect, protection, more protection of uh, the nature. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there are a number of uh, reasons we can say that it, it is resonating. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, uh, the uh, Conservation Continent Report held apply the broader economic report's findings uh, to Africa, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it helped show not only that they are consistent, uh, but uh, that there may be an ever greater opportunity to invest in nature 
uh, mm -hmm. benefit from that than anywhere else in, in the globe. So Africa should lead in this process uh, because, as I said, as a late comer, we have huge opportunity and advantage to do so. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to see that the African Union, our continental organization, uh, take mm -hmm. this agenda as mm -hmm. uh, at the top of it and uh, I think uh, supporting a much more comprehensive focus mm -hmm. on uh, protecting and investing in nature. Um, part of this should include the commitment to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. As uh, the senator has said, it doesn't mean that every country has to go for 30%. We mm -hmm. have uh, some countries which can exceed that on, mm -hmm. on average and in balance, we can come to the 2030. So mm -hmm. African countries have a big role to play mm -hmm. uh, in setting the global target and in helping to achieve it. So, and mm -hmm. it, it will be even more powerful if the continent speaks with one voice. We have experience in doing so uh, because in the climate uh, convention, uh, I think we tried to come up. My late Prime Minister Melles uh, was uh, uh, an African voice. Mm -hmm. uh, he helped a lot to steer this process. And many civil society organizations of African origin, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, intellectual community, and government uh, bodies all were engaged in uh, bringing this idea into uh, the forum as one voice. So I expect Africa to come with one voice in speaking on uh, the 3030 agenda uh, mm -hmm. next time. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. And indeed, um, the African country has a very important role in the negotiations and uh, hopefully the continent will speak in one voice. Um, Senator Feingold, you spoke last about the need for increased financing. Mm -hmm. Have you seen more political willingness in the last weeks on increasing finance? And do you think that it will happen? Mm -hmm. Well, once again, the prime minister has really set the stage for this um, by mm -hmm. talking about all the different things that are happening in Africa within the individual countries to try to preserve their natural areas. But it reminds me of an experience, I, a conversation I had in Rwanda in this regard. Uh, on my trip last year, we had a lovely meeting with the head of forestry in Rwanda, and he was so proud that mm -hmm. we were going to increase their, their, their forest areas. But he said to me, Senator, you understand, though, we don't have a school of forestry. Mm -hmm. so without foresters and without the resources for managing, yeah. it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the world has to step up to the plate. If we want Africa to be able to do what it wants to do, it can't mm -hmm. afford many of the countries to do all this without some of this help. And so this is where the financing is absolutely essential. Uh, the intention is there, the political leadership is there, the creativity is there, uh, but there needs to be financing. Um, it is hard and it's gonna take time, but I am optimistic. This week on the sidelines of UNGA, there was an event, the Nature Finance Forum, mm -hmm. where countries and philanthropies and businesses came together to call for more funding and to announce some steps that they are taking to achieve that. We need a lot more. It's a start. We expect, and I know there will be a lot more work at over on this over the next year, leading up to the COP15 program that I've talked about happening in Kunming in May. I'm chairing this campaign for Global Nature's Global Steering Committee that I mentioned. And we as a group, including the prime minister here, view it as a priority to increase more financial commitments. We expect this work will need to continue into the coming decade, but we're starting it now and believe that we will succeed. Uh, mm -hmm. And as, as the professor said, look, this works too because it works economically if you do that. It has an enormous positive impact economically. Mm -hmm. These countries mm -hmm. need to feed their people. Yeah. So you can't expect them to simply preserve without mm -hmm. being able to feed the people in their countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, Yesterday, there were some very good statements made uh, at the Nature Summit. Uh, the mm -hmm. country was saying the right things, to be totally candid. Uh, could have been more specific. Uh, there could have been a little bit more talk of specific financial commitments mm -hmm. uh, to, to push for that. But I did like uh, uh, the, the headline in a recent uh, article in Reuters just a couple of days ago, 
is entitled Starting Gun Fired on Global Hunt for Hundreds of Billions to Fund Nature Protection. And there were some, you know, specifics. Mm -hmm. um, Germany said it would increase by 500 million euro its annual investment in protecting biodiversity. Uh, Britain said it would increase its spending on forest protection uh, mm -hmm. as well. And so uh, we're beginning to see that. And yes, wealthy individuals and foundations around the world have to do this as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It's enormously important. It's not a really meaningful process if we don't deal with the financing issue. Hmm. Thank you, Senator. And absolutely, the financing piece is a critical and very essential one in the negotiations. And as you said, hopefully in the upcoming month, we will be able to bring more attention to it and more support of um, all of the, 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 the sectors um, to, to support this financing gap. Um, Professor Sumaila, you are an expert on marine ecosystems and fisheries. The 30-30 target includes 30% of land and 30% of the ocean. How can an ambitious goal like 30 by 30 work for ocean? Is it possible to increase marine conservation without impacting fisheries and food supplies? Yeah, you know, uh, all, all our studies, me and colleagues, we actually have uh, shown that the marine protection is a good thing for biodiversity, is good for economics, and actually, if done properly, can be good for social, for social uh, meeting some of our social goals. And I, I'll explain this. Number one, one of the key values of protection is insurance. You are buying insurance for yourself because we are people, we make mistakes where we fish. If you have 30% protected in case of either mistakes or even deliberate overfishing, illegal fishing, you have the backup to help you. So the insurance value alone, according to some of my analysis, is enough to actually go out and do this. It protects you. That's the same way you do with your retirement account. You don't put everything in Tesla stocks. Even though Tesla is flying today, you never know tomorrow. In fact, a few weeks ago, we saw it crash by 21% in a day. So you don't do that. You put in safe investment. So that's what protection does you. And it, it can increase your recreational value. And Africa has a huge potential here where, where the continent can protect and still gain from it. Uh, we did calculations where our conclusion was that a whale is more valuable alive than dead. A shark. A shark can bring you over a million dollars in their lifetime if you protect it and people go to watch it. But if you kill it and just take soup in the fin, it's maybe hundred dollars. So, so there is a lot of gain to be made here, and we need. To, how about the carbon value? I can keep going. I mean, there, there's a huge uh, potential here, and I see Africa actually as an island. Africa is a big island plus small other ones, right? So we are an ocean continent also. And, and you just look around, and fish is so important. I tell them many people in West Africa will not have any protein in their diet. Without fish, and I'm sure it's the same in many communities in East Africa, Southern Africa, Norfolk. So this is a livelihood thing. This is a survival thing. I say that the ocean is our life because the values are just too much to ignore. You cannot ignore the ocean uh, if you do at your own peril. And in terms of doing this practically, I said there are values to be made if we think we can actually gain from closing the IC. Palau close, has closed, I think, up to 80% of their waters uh, to international fishing. Only locals can fish in 20%, and the recreational values are amazing. They are just growing. So you can do this. Now, globally, maybe one thing Africa can do is probably to support a proposal I started talking about a few years ago. It's a crazy one. People thought I was crazy, but it's getting more and more traction. I say, you know, the ocean is made of country waters and then the high seas, areas beyond national jurisdiction. These are badly managed because it's no, no person's area, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have some mechanism, but in general, people fish if they want to fish there. So I propose that we turn the high seas into a fish bank for the world where there's no fishing, when the fish go there, they have peace, they grow, they come into the waters, you catch them cheaply, you don't pump CO2, and at the moment, seven countries, big countries take more than 70% of the value. If you do that, the fish will come into Guinea-Bissau and they can catch it. So it's good in terms of equity. And these are the kind of big things we can do 
and protect our ocean and help people, real people, you know. There's so much. Uh, and in Africa, as you know, there's a lot of illegal fishing from the, the China will come in, some European boats. I think if we use protection cleverly, we can put the protected areas around the boundary with the high sea so it will be like a buffer. So mm -hmm. they, they, usually they are sitting at the door as soon as they stick in and catch the fish. But if you have protection around the continent like that, then you have some buffer and we can supervise and, and check that one. So mm -hmm. this is good business. It can be done. Lots of good reasons to do it. Just do it. Just do it. The continent, go out and do it. I really believe in this and let's keep pushing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Semaila, for um, your very passionate response. Uh, and uh, I do agree with, with you. We should just do it. Um, conscious of time, and since we only have a few more minutes, yeah. I would like to ask one final question to each of you. Mm. At one minute, what's the most important me message you think our audience should take away from today's conversation? And I will start with you, Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Rita. I think this is a very good uh, discussion mm. uh, we are making today. And um, usually, uh, African leaders, uh, mm. in most cases, see that uh, you know, uh, protecting and investing in nature is something which has come from outside, uh, mm. maybe, maybe mainly from the north. Mm. Uh, our leaders are thinking that the money also should come from the north. Uh, mm. uh, but that's not true. Our forefathers are the ones who were conserving the nature. Mm. They are dependent mm. on the nature. And they know how to conserve and how to survive because of mm. that nature. So mm. I think we have to think that Africa is not new and it has not come mm. from somewhere else. It mm. is an African issue. It is an African culture, mm. and it is within the African tradition. You know, mm. you know there are many tribal groups uh, which are very much protective of uh, the foresters because even sometimes they go for worshiping the forest itself and as the main, you know, uh, something like a god. So that is an important culture we have, and we have to go back and look into mm. serving and protecting our forest. And mm. with the economics, as the professor said, is supporting us. Mm. I think we should not always fix ourselves on, on the traditional ways, and we have to come out of the box and mm. think that nature has huge potential to serve us. Mm. Uh, all the shocks, as I say, uh, are because of uh, the depletion we have made on nature, uh, mm -hmm. you know, unsustainable use of our natural resources. So I think this is very clear. And mm -hmm. survival is at risk uh, mm -hmm. at this moment if we don't protect and invest on in our nature. So I think this is an existential issue and somebody shouldn't externalize it. Mm -hmm. It is uh, an important issue and I urge, uh, you know, uh, political leaders, business mm. leaders, intellectual community in Africa to mm. stand together, speak with one voice and mm. protect and invest in nature. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Senator uh, Feingold, one minute. Well, this program had the perfect title. This is an opportunity, uh, you know, here in the United States and North America, uh, people weren't so smart about this. And in this state that I'm sitting in, the beautiful state of Wisconsin, they decided it was a good idea in the late 19th century to cut down all the trees. They cut them all down so they could build Chicago and other places. But it was an environmental disaster. As the Prime Minister said, because of the traditions and the respect in Africa, that has not happened. And now that we know how to preserve things like this, now that we can get the resources to help manage things properly, both in the water and the, and the sea, that Africa really will be the leader. And this will have a great impact on our environment, on our safety, our health, and our economy. And so uh, I, I, I've got to tell you, you've all put me in a very good mood, and I thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Professor uh, Sumaila, one minute. So, so two quick points. The one is a summary. So 
It is affordable to protect 30% by 30, 2030. It is a good investment. We can do it, so we do it. The second point actually links to the Prime Minister's point about Africa and Africans and conservation. I just give you one example from my grandfather, actually. I really believe he was the first one to put conservation in my head without me knowing, right? I remember when we were little kids, we were running and jumping and and then the old man will say, hey, you guys, why are you so hard on, on, on the F? You are stepping on the ground too hard. You should step on the ground as if it feels pains. And I never forgot that. To me, that's the beginning. My relationship with the environmental sensitivity and environmental awareness. So this is as African as anything can be. Don't let this be taken away by anyone. We are the home of conservation. We yeah. should do it, and that will help our people more importantly at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your brilliant responses and for such an interesting panel. Mm -hmm. Let me close by saying that we are at a turning point. Uh, it is time for a paradigm change to avoid repeating the wrongful practices, as uh, mm -hmm. Senator Feingold was saying from the past, mm -hmm. that led us to the critical moment we are facing now. It is more essential than ever to safeguard an ambitious and transformative deal at the COP15. And quoting the report issued by the Prime Minister, there are many tough decisions to be made in Africa in the aftermath of COVID-19. By viewing this as less of a crisis and more of an opportunity, it may be possible to use this unprecedented uh, pandemic to pivot Africa from its current development course and ensure growth in an economically and environmentally sustainable way. Hmm. As mentioned at the beginning uh, of the panel, Costa Rica and France are co-chairing the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, which is a growing interregional group of countries with hmm. the central goal of protecting 30% of the planet by 2030. Hmm. The coalition has the support of over 34 countries, many of which are from Africa. I encourage you to join the High Ambition Coalition so we can work collectively to achieve an ambitious outcome at the CBD in 2021. Hmm. And I wish to thank our extraordinary panelists, Thank you for joining the event, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great evening and afternoon. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.